podcast called uh, Dub Jelly Slim Podcast. First ever type 1 diabetic in UFC history. Uh, doing fine, Dub. Nice to be with you. Get out! <laughs> He's like, yeah. My tunnel vision and my periphery, I'm like all field. Hey, you know how it is, Dub. Hey, when you're, hey, when you're team. <laughs> I don't remember that. That's crazy. What's up, everyone? We're back with another episode of Dub Jelly Slim Podcast. Today, I have a very special guest, Mr. Gavin Schilling. Gavin, how are you? I'm doing well. Uh, very, uh, thank you for having me. I'm excited to get it started. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for coming on. So, sorry about that whole, I mean, mix up with the times. I don't I don't know if it was like date. I guess it's like Eastern Daylight Time or whatever. And it, I don't know. It gets all messed up. I mess that stuff up all the time. But uh, <laughs> thanks for coming on, like I mentioned, all the way from Germany. Um, yeah. How's your first week back over there been? Um, it's been pretty good so far, you know, like getting uh, settled in. Um quite smoothly so far you know I, I got my apartment um you know I got a nice car uh, that the team gave me um and today was actually our first day that we uh, kind of went live uh well not really live we did a lot of five on oh things um uh, some um skill work uh things like that um so it was cool to you know you know um kind of gel with uh, my new teammates and uh, meet meet the coaching staff and things like that mm -hmm. and I, I saw like I've had, I talked to a lot of guys that are playing overseas and heading over there now, and they've they've all talked about being like locked in and how it's really isolating over there. Um, but I mean, you've been outside quite a bit, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the the crazy thing is, I mean, a lot of people I guess don't really know this, but I'm half German. Mm -hmm. You know, so my my father uh, he lives in Germany here, um, actually not too far away, but about an hour away. So, you know, it's it's not I don't feel as isolated because I do have family here, um, which is, um, you know, very comforting. Um, so, you know, I could just whenever I feel, you know, lonely or whatnot, I could just, you know, drive over and, you know, have uh, have dinner with my, my, my German family here. So mm -hmm. um, so it's cool. It's really uh, it works out for me. Yeah, that's got to be super nice, because like I mentioned, a lot of guys talk about I mean, they go to practice and then they come home and they play video games or just watch TV or whatever. How how much did that help you in terms of the transition to pro basketball overseas? Um, it, it helped me uh, a lot, you know, um, especially, you know, coming over here, um, you know, my first year after college, um, what really, the, the transition on the court was the hardest part for me, you know, because the um, the style of play is just different in Europe. Than, uh, than in college. Um, so that was something I, I had to get used to. Uh, but as far as like off the court, I never really, um, you know, had issues, uh, you know, cause I can, I can speak the language as well. So I, I was able to meet, you know, other people outside of the team and, and, you know, um, build new relationships uh, like that. And, you know, uh, that's uh, kind of worked out for me. Mm -hmm. Cause when I was doing a little bit of prep for this podcast, I saw you'd played in Germany your entire pro career to this point. I mean, do you think that's going to be a consistent thing going forward just because you're, you have family there? Um, you know, that, that's something that, um, you know, I mean, I have the, you know, German passport, you know, the dual citizenship. So mm -hmm. that makes me, um, I count as a German player here, which uh, makes me, I guess, more valuable. Um, but I, I do see myself playing uh, somewhere else, you know, I mean, outside of Germany, definitely in the future. Um, you know, just for right now, I guess being in Germany is uh, is a good fit for me. But I, I do see myself playing outside of Germany sometime in the future, for sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, like you mentioned, you're kind of joined with your new teammates today. You signed with FC Bayern Munich uh, for the upcoming season. Talk about the process of signing with them. Um, it's uh, it's, it's been a, I mean, I'm, I'm actually real grateful to be here, actually, you know, um, to be playing, uh, I guess you know, the top with the top team in Germany, mm. um, you know, and, and they're competing also in the Euro League, which is you know the the highest European league in, in Europe. Um, so, you know, I couldn't ask for a better opportunity right now, and um, I'm just really grateful and blessed to to be in the position I am, you know. Um, so I'm just trying to make the best out of it now. And I mean, why do you think that this team in in particular was a good fit for you? Um, you know, I've always wanted to, you know, play at the highest European level and, you know, to, to be in Germany and playing at the highest level is, is like a, you know, a double, uh, you know, 
a, a double, uh, I, I don't know how to say, like a good thing, I guess. <laughs> it's a, yeah. So, you know, um, just works out, you know, and uh, uh, yeah, you know, I feel comfortable, you know, like I said, you know, I got family here. I know the language now I'm playing at the highest level. So it's like, um, you know, can't ask for any, anything better, really. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I don't think that you knew this, but I had a, one of your teammates on the podcast before, Deshaun Thomas. Um, so how how excited are you to play with guys like him and, and Darren Hillard? Um, just, I mean, other guys that have been brought in this year as well. Yeah, um, you know, uh, uh, actually, uh, Deshaun Thomas, um, I haven't got a chance to meet him yet. He actually, I think, just arrived today. Um, so he he was one of the guys that wasn't in practice. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to, um, to meeting him. You know, I heard a lot of good things about him. You know, obviously, I've, I've, I've kind of watched him um, in the past few years uh, here playing in Europe. Um, and, uh, yeah, Darren, he's a nice, he's a cool dude. Uh, me and him got along like that right off the bat, um, you know, so I'm excited to, you know, spend the whole season with with them and, um, and go through all the highs and the lows and, you know, uh, it's going to be a good one. I mean, who are some of the best players that you've been teammates with already in the three plus years that you've been there? I know a few guys just off the top of my head were Killing Hayes, Zoran Dragic, Archie Goodwin. I mean, that team, you're, your second year, I believe, that team was loaded, in my opinion, just with college athletes from America. Yeah, yeah, that is true. Um, my second year, I probably had like the, the biggest uh, names, I guess, um, that, that, that you can think of. Um, you know, I'm, I mean, I played with a lot of good guys. I played with a lot of uh, great guys thus far. Um, even my first year, um, you know, uh, Patrick Miller, Dwayne Evans, who were both in, from Chicago, you know, where, where I'm from as well in, in, in America. So. Um, I got a chance to play with them and other other guys as well. Javante Green, who's who's now uh, with the with the Bulls. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I mean you name. Them. I mean like uh, then my second year, obviously in Ulm with with those guys you just named. You know it's cool to you know just each year you play with different people and uh, you 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 make new relationships and it's um, it's really a, a great thing to to have. And as far as Killian Hayes, did you know that he would be successful at the next level? Because I know he came over the year after that to like put his name in the draft and everything like that. Right, right. Yeah, um, I mean, he, he basically, he knew, you know, I mean, everybody knew that he was going to just be there in Ulm for one year. You know, um, you know, his, his family was, was out there with him. Um, he and obviously the coach, uh, we had a new coach that season as well. And, uh, you know, he he worked hard, you know. He he definitely we saw his potential from day one. Um, he proved himself in the BBL and the German league in the first German league, and you know, as, as an 18 year old to you know have that that poise and um, you know that those skills, and then to be able to you know put himself through a whole season like that and averaging those numbers. I mean, that's that's special. So you know, um, yeah, he's a he's a special kid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, how kind of going back to some of the the older teammates that you've have that you've had, um, how valuable is it to be around those guys that have had long term success overseas and kind of get tips and tricks from them? You know, I'm always um, soaking up, trying to soak up new knowledge. You know, from um, from people that have been here longer than I have, um, from all my vets, obviously. Um, you know, it's always cool to, to hear their side of things, their side of the story and, you know, what they went through, you know, to get there. And, you know, I try to just, you know, take that and then uh, just find, build my own way, build my own path, um, you know, along along my career and, you know, use that to my advantage. Mm -hmm. Do you kind of see yourself adopting that role of being a, being a leader as your career progresses overseas? Uh, definitely, definitely, um, you know, that's something that, uh, that I've been working on and something that even last year, you know, in, when I was in a Braunschweig um, and, and also in the first uh, German league, um, I, I I was able to kind of take a, on a, a more of a leadership role because I was one of the older guys because we had a really young team. Mm -hmm. So it was cool to, um, to kind of, uh, you know, be that, be in that position, you know, and obviously I had a lot of trust from, from the coach. Um, so it, it was, it was cool to, um, to finally, you know, actually be one of the, the vets, I guess, you know. <laughs> Make you feel old. Um, 
I mean, last year was obviously your best year as a pro this far. I mean, talk about your growth just between the first two years and then last year going into this upcoming season as well. Um, yeah, my, I mean, my first two years, um, you, I mean, I, obviously my first year I was still trying to get adjusted to, you know, the style of play and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so it kind of took a minute and I also had um, suffered an injury early on in the season. So I really couldn't find my rhythm uh, that year. But then my second year is when uh, I really, you know, found my my, my niche and, um, and kind of, um, you know, found my rhythm. And um, and I was able to have a, a solid season. Um, and then we had a little tournament um, at the end of the season uh, to, because of COVID. Um, so I was able to really perform well in that tournament and that little bubble we had. And, you know, that really kind of uh, kicked things off for me, you know, uh, kind of my confidence grew from there. And I was able to, you know, carry it on into my third season, then my third year, and, and now I'm here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, how much, how far, how far do you see yourself growing just from, from last year to this year? Like you mentioned, just having that, that level of confidence and kind of finding your group. Um, it's, um, it's a really important, you know, because, um, you know, I was, I was put in a different position, like as far as, um, like it, within the team. So obviously I had a lot of, a lot more responsibility uh, last season. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to take that same confidence that I had last season. I may not have the same role, you know, this season on this team, but I want to take the same confidence I had definitely and, um, and try to try to implement it in, in, um, in this team. This season mm. and is there a line that you have to kind of find of realizing the level of basketball you fit into and in, in your role within that level as well yeah yeah I mean uh, at the Euro League level it's um you know it's it's basically you know the, the second league beneath the, the NBA so you know I mean everything is really professional here um the coaches you know I mean they you know, they, they put you, obviously you have a specific role, you know, and you have to try to follow that to the best of your ability. And, you know, obviously if, if you know, you have a coach can give you like more leeway, you know, if, if you perfect your role already, you know, you can build on that, you know, so that's really what I'm looking to do, you know, just trying to get my, my base down, my, my role down first and, and perfect that first. And then, you know, um, kind of grow from there, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, how hard is it to kind of deal with some of those coaches over there? Because I know, um, I forget. Oh, Nick's. I had Nick eyes off on podcast last week, and and he was talking about how some of his former college teammates they lasted like four weeks playing overseas just because they couldn't really deal with the coach, and it was just too much for him. So, how is it difficult to deal with the coaches that you've had? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I'm gonna say it is like um, European basketball is not for everybody. You know, um, especially if, if you're dealing with a with a coach, with a with a hard coach, with a tough coach, and you know, you're by yourself here. You know, you really have no one to vent to. Obviously, face to face, like 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 you want to. So, um, it's something you just have to be. You just have to be mentally tough. You know, and you know, like I said, I'm I'm grateful to have family here that I can go to. You know, and talk to whenever you know I'm, I'm having issues, maybe or things like that. So. Um, but yeah, I mean, coaches out here are different, you know, um, kind of reminds me or well, the coach this season that I have now, well, coach, uh, uh, Trin Trinkieri, he's, um, he's also, um, known to be one of those, uh, hard nosed, tough coaches. And, um, you know, kind of reminds me of my college days when uh, I was playing other coaches though. So, um, mm -hmm. it's really nothing that, um, that I'm not used to. So. Um, but I, I kind of at the same time I like coaches like that because they they all they want to do is win you know that they push you to be your best and I feel like you can get you can improve the most under those type of coaches you know obviously you know they're not um you can't have a you can't be weak minded you know if, if you want to play under a coach like that so it's just something you you gotta just Whenever you know something's when he throws it, when he's throwing something at you, you just gotta in in, in one ear out the other. You know, it's it's uh, you got to kind of have a short short term memory, and um, yeah. So so that's that's what it's, it's what it is now. Yeah. Yeah, I can tell that you. I mean, you wouldn't really have issue with being coach hard or coaching a certain way. But do you see other? Have you seen other guys maybe on previous teams 
that get coached that way and they just – something flips and they just shut off? Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, like you said, like, um, you know, guys that are only there for four weeks and just leave, you know, it's – it's um, yeah, um, it, it depends on the players, really, on the person. Um, some some guys just can't take it, you know. Some guys just, you know, rather, you know, just do – play their style, do whatever they want, you know, and, and kind of – I don't know. Um, but I feel like you're not going to get far, you know, uh, if, if you can't – if you can't, you know – um, kind of take that, you know, and, and kind of um, understand why, you know, the, why it's like that, you know, and the, at the same time, you got a, the message that the coach is telling you, you can't really take it like you can't listen to him in the, in the tone, you know, it's really the message, the words that he's telling you. So, you know, some guys get emotional, you know, or, or, and, and that's really not, um, if, you, if you're like that, it's, it's, so this level is probably not for you, you know. Yeah, fair enough. Um, you mentioned, obviously, Coach Izzo. That's how I first um, kind of noticed you, I guess, because um, I'm a Purdue guy. So I, I've watched you for, what is it, eight years now. Um, I mean, what was it like to be coached under Coach Izzo? Such a, a legendary guy of Naismith Basketball Hall of Famer. Yeah, um, he's uh, – I mean, uh, there's not many people built like – I'm gonna say that you know um, I have my fair fair share of uh, stories about him, but like um, yeah, um, he he's one of those guys that you know he's gonna give it to you you know the, the way it is you know he's not gonna sugarcoat things you know um, a tough nosed guy and uh, and I feel like he I was able to bring that with me now into my professional career and. Um, in the hindsight, in the hindsight, I look back and just um, I'm grateful for the way you know he uh, he coached me and and uh, yeah, you know I, I hope that I can just use that to my advantage now. Mm -hmm. All right, well you tease it. You got to give me a good is a story now. Oh man, um, that's tough. Uh, let me think real quick. Uh, uh, yeah, well I guess. Um, <laughs> my first uh my first practice ever um when I was at Michigan State uh I kind of I, I walked into practice um like maybe 20 minutes before practice and I had like a you and I went through like the office way so like all the all the coaches in the um in the office can, can like see me come through and like that was the wrong way to go so I you know guys go down the tunnel down to the locker room you're supposed to go that way so I, and you're supposed to arrive about an hour before practice. So I come in 20 minutes uh, before practice and, um, you know, with like a smoothie in my hand and I'm, I'm walking across the practice gym, like, and I see everybody like warming up and things like that. And I'm like, oh, I better get down to the locker room and change as quick as I can. So um, so I, I went ahead and changed and, um, and then right before practice, uh, we held it up and he just like, um, like cursed me out, you know, in front of everybody. So um, I kind of learned my lesson, man. I learned my lesson that day, and um, never again will I show up. You know, 20 minutes before, I'm always I was always there an hour before, you know, getting my work in, getting treatment, whatnot. So uh, that was a lesson I learned from day one. I mean, from a from a fan's perspective, like obviously, I Purdue and Michigan State that we have their battles, but um, I've always respected coaches. Though I think he's the second best coach in the Big Ten behind Coach Payne, obviously. Um, but, I mean, what what do you think makes him such a good leader and coach? Like, I don't know how long he's been there now, but to have as many wins and Final Fours and things of that nature. Yeah, um, I mean, what separates him is just his work ethic. Um, you know, that guy during the season, he, he basically, like, lives in his office. You know, uh, some nights he even sleeps in there, I, I think. You know, I mean, he has a whole shower or bathroom in there, like, yeah, like it's uh, it's it's pretty crazy, but he his attention to detail, you know, for you know for the scouting, you know, we watch film on teams, you know, like a day after the like the the game before, you know, for the next game, you know, and we we're watching film two times a day every day until the, we lead up to the game, you know, and um, uh, not a lot of teams I think do that, you know, pay attention to the detail like that, and you know his assistants obviously are very trusted as well. They've been with him for years, and they just know how to. You know, they just run things the Michigan State way, I guess. You know, and 
they mm -hmm. understand that and then they get their players to understand that as well. So, yeah. And going back to your career at, at Michigan State, what was it like to come into a program that was, I mean, absolutely loaded your freshman year with like Gary Harris, Adrian Payne, Keith Appling. I mean, you can go down the list, but was it kind of, was it uh, intimidating for you to come in and know that you're going to be asked to, to contribute right away and you have to live up to these expectations with all the talent you guys had? Yeah, um, I mean, it was, it was tough, you know, um, to play around all that talent, I guess. Um, but at the same time, you know, they made better in practice every day. Um, you know, my, my focus coming in was just to do whatever I, I could help, can to help the team, you know, um, whether that be you know, obviously on the defensive end, you know, grab every rebound in sight, you know, um, to play the hardest defense I can and run, run the floor, things like that. So, um, and, I, and I was playing my hardest and coach noticed that. And, and, you know, in the summer, I had one of the best summers, you know, coming into, um, you know, that, that summer coming into my freshman year. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it, it was um, it, it was a good experience, you know, to, to play with those guys every day in practice against those guys. And um, I definitely got better that way mentally and physically, for sure. Mm -hmm. And did you see any similarities? Like, I mean, as I mentioned, there's a long list of guys like get add in Denzel Valentine, Trice, Bridges, Winston Ward. I mean, you can go down the list, like I said, but did you see any similarities between those older guys when you came in and then the younger classes that came in when, when you were a junior and senior? Yeah, um, definitely. I mean, you know, the generation has kind of changed, you know, um, I, I want to, I mean, I'm just going to tell like it is, it, 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 we've got, they've gotten softer, you know, over the years, I would say, you know, coach, uh, he's also has gotten softer in his coaching because he had no choice but to become like that, you know, because, Kids they th take things differently, you know. They they kind of um, you know baby growing up, and um, I guess you can't really coach like you can't really have that old school mentality anymore when coaching you know young players these days. And you know that's something that yeah he had a hard time understanding. I I, I think he's I mean I don't know I've, I've heard that he's he's softened up a bit, um, so it's kind of hard to to really uh, see that, but I guess he has, you know, and um, um, that's something that I, I'm sure he he had a hard time doing, but, you know, I mean, in order for him to have success now with this younger generation, it's something he had to adapt to, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I believe it was in the NCAA tournament. Um, There's this whole, like, situation, I guess, where he, like, grabbed Greg Brown's arm and Twitter, like, erupted about it. And I was like, well, I mean, we'll see what it is. And then the whole team like supported and did, I mean, I mean, did you see that situation at all or were you not? Yeah, I kind of, I kind of got, um, um, I kind of uh, saw it a little bit while I was here. Um, I kind of heard about it. I definitely did. Um, you know, I mean, but that's, that's like nothing, you know, compared to what he was doing with us, you know what I mean? I had assistant coaches punch me in the chest in the huddles, like for me, like looking away, like for a quick second while I wasn't paying attention and things like that. So, you know, um, it's just it's just another one of those things that I guess people aren't used to seeing these days. And then that's a perfect example of this a new generation, you know, so, um, but that's, that's nothing, you know, I mean, that's why, you know, the players kind of stood behind them because they understand, you know, what, what kind of guy he is, you know. When do you think that when do you think that shift was because I mean obviously when you came in I can tell that you're a tough-minded individual but when do you think that shift in terms of guys getting a lot softer um, over recent years that's a good question um, I mean I would say after I left you know um, you know kind of started uh, yeah after I left I mean what that was what for four years now, four years ago almost. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, I guess during that time, uh, that's when I, you know, I mean, I, I, I haven't, I wasn't there. I mean, I haven't been, you know, in the basketball scene over there, so I can't really, you know, speak for that. But I would say yeah, after I graduated is when I kind of noticed, like, you know, people, uh, you know, the generation changing a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it, it might have even changed a little bit before that, but just the kind of the culture that is so set forth, it, it pushed that back maybe a few years or however long. So it wasn't going to get to 
Michigan State until a few years down the road. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, repeat that question one more time. Like, I feel like that kind of shift in the culture of guys becoming softer got pushed back at Michigan State just because of the culture that Coach Izzo has set forth over three decades at this point. Right, right. I mean, coming to Michigan State, you kind of know what you're going to get get yourself into, you know, um, dealing with coach, you know, um, and it's it's up to you whether you know you want to, you know, take it or not. So um, you know, I, you see guys transferring out more frequently now as well, and I think that also has a lot to do with um, you know the mental load that you know Michigan State um, you know get offers, I guess. Um, you know, it isn't for everybody. Just like playing over here isn't for everybody. You know, it's, it takes a certain uh, mental toughness. And, you know, um, but I feel like if you can endure that and, and come through successful, then, you know, that's that's, that's already speaking, uh, speaking loud. So, um, yeah. So, like, looking back at your career, um, obviously you weren't, like, the guy. Um, you're, I don't want to say a role player, but I mean, you had your niche and you did it really well, but you weren't like the focal point of the offense and things like that. I feel like a lot of guys in that situation now within the last couple of years, they would just transfer out of there. So do you have an opinion on the whole transfer portal fiasco that's kind of taken over the college basketball world? Yeah, I mean, you know, um, like if the things don't go your way, you know, I guess, guys now just just give up and like transfer they think that's the answer but you know it's really not so um you know looking back you know i i you know i'm not gonna it's, a, it's really like quitting like giving up you know and that's something i've never um i could never relate to and um that's that's why you know i, I didn't leave you know even when, when times did get tough you know uh, i just knew that that i i couldn't give up you know so i, mm -hmm. I just have to stick it through and um and yeah, that's that's just the way it was. Mm. And then it, I mean, you did kind of embrace that leadership role, I would say, your senior year, because it was, I think it was only you, Tum Tum, and, and Ben Carter were yeah. seniors that lot your fifth year, actually. Um, I mean, how did you approach that leadership role and kind of being there for the younger guys? Because it was a fairly young team. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, Tom, Tom, Tom was, a, was a great leader. Um, you know, I kind of, um, me and him, you know, we, we were together for a long time. So uh, we, we try to, you know, give our give our knowledge down to the guys that, you know, um, to, to the guys that, the young guys coming in, you know, and, um, you know, I try to give as much knowledge as I could to, you know, especially the guys playing my position, you know, that, that were coming in. And, um, yeah, I, I did that to the best of my ability. And, and um, you know, coach had respect for that. And, you know, guys listened as well. So. Um, so yeah, you know they they and that's really something that they they uh, prioritize. You know over there is is listening to the to the guys that came before you, and um, you know guys that really paved the way. You know before before that time. So you know and that's why everybody comes back. It's a, it's a family atmosphere over there, and uh, not a lot of schools have that. And you know to this day, I still t stay in touch with um, some of the guys that even played there before I got there. You know, because they, they would come back in the summers or during the year and, and come practice with us, come talk to us. So uh, I feel like not a lot of schools had that. And, you know, I was grateful to be part of that. Mm. I mean, did you – I know we're getting short on time, so I don't I don't want to hold you too long. But did you ever see yourself turning into is a little bit when you were a senior kind of having to lay down the law for the younger guys? Because I know um, I have a good relationship with Rayfeld Davis, who I'm sure – I'm. I believe you played against, but I mean, he would make people run Mackeys and do the Stairmasters and all this crazy stuff. Did you have that same experience as well? Yeah, I mean, I, it wasn't like I wasn't the guy to really, you know, um, all right, go go run this, go do this, you know, because like I, that's not really my, my type of uh, leadership style, but like I'm one of those uh, lead by example type of guys, you know, and, you know, whenever I did say something, you know, people would listen because I didn't, I didn't talk much, you know, so, um, yeah, I just uh, that was my my leadership style, and you know that's um, something that the guys did respect at the time. Mm -hmm. And one thing I forgot to ask about was, I mean, that class of like it, it was Miles Bridges, Cassius Winston, Nick Ward, and then Joshua Langford. Um, 
I mean, what was that group like when they were coming in to just kind of to kind of be around? Um, it was it was a fun time. I mean, that was the year I was I sat out. I was injured, so I try to you know lead as much as I could um, from the sideline. But um, it was fun seeing those guys gel together, you know, and, and have success together, you know, and um, you know uh, it was cool, and I wish nothing but the best for those guys. And uh, yeah, you know. Um, yeah. And then I just have a few more questions for you. Um, I mean, do you have any favorite games or moments or stretches from your time um, in East Lansing? Yeah, um, I would have to say, well, one of my favorite experiences was obviously uh, the 2015 Final Four, where we went to uh, Indianapolis and um, played at the Lewis Oil Stadium. That was a uh, a hell of experience, you know, um, playing in front of like 60,000 fans, you know, coming out to the court that, that, that first first time and seeing all, you know, it's kind of like you're, you're in a dream. Um, so, I, you know, that was a, that whole experience was, was, you know, once in a lifetime thing and I'll never forget that. Um, and then uh, my other experience that I had um, was uh, the uh, Big Ten. Uh, we actually, <laughs> we played Purdue. Um, when we won the Big Ten tournament outright, or I mean Big Ten, uh, Big Ten conference outright. Yeah, uh, that was my um, my lat my scene my fifth year I believe right. Or what? Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 It was. It was. Yeah. So um, you know, I, I had a great game that game, and um, you know, defending Isaac Haas that game, and um, and, and kind of stopping him, you know, um, on the defensive end, and uh, just having an impact to to actually, you know win that game and, and, and win the Big Ten all right was a, was a special moment to me, so. Mm. It's kind of a funny story about that. The The day before during the semifinals, you guys played Maryland. We played Michigan, I believe. It was the first ever Purdue game I went to, and it was in Indy. So then in between games, because you guys were the second game, me and my cousin, we somehow got down to like the second row right behind your guys' bench. So we were listening to Izzo go off the entire time. So it was it was kind of crazy to hear him um, the coach that way, but I mean those are some good games. I mean Purdue and Michigan State, I I feel like they have a lot of similarities. I don't know if you think that as well, but yeah, yeah. I mean Purdue is also built built off built on toughness, you know. So um, you know I have a lot of respect for Purdue and um, respect for their uh, their culture, um, but you know it's uh it's, it's go green this way. So <laughs> fair enough. Um, and then last question is. Do you have a favorite Big Ten rival that you like to play against and which opposing team's environment was toughest to deal with? Yeah, playing against Michigan obviously is a, is a game, is a game of, the, of the season. So, you know, you know, that whole week everyone's on edge. Um, that's uh that's definitely the game everyone circles on their calendar, you know. Um, so that's definitely um uh, one big game that we look forward to every season. And um I'm trying to think what other team um I like playing at Indiana. Indiana had a had a nice atmosphere over there, mm -hmm. um, so um, that was that was cool too. Playing playing over there, um, that, that, that's about it. I mean, even Purdue, they had that that small gym. You know, it's uh, whenever you play in, a, in an atmosphere like that, you know, with the students right there, you know, it's uh, it's always tough. You know, so um, yeah, um, that's about it though. Mm -hmm. Hey man, I'm gonna let you go. Um... But thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. And uh, good luck this season. Thanks, Doug. Thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it, man. Yes, sir. Stay safe. All right, you too.